on our live stream. Um, this is an introduction. Dr. Bridget Irwin is a psychologist, speaker, and author. She founded and directed one of the leading Philadelphia area providers of evidence-based programs for personal and professional development. The organization's programs include the Anxiety and OCD Center, Dr. Irwin Consulting, and Coaching for Calm and Confidence. Distinguished by its use of evidence-based practices and on-site training of all providers, the Anxiety and OCD Center is one of the Philadelphia region's largest practices specializing in the treatment of anxiety and related disorders. Dr. Irwin Consulting provides evidence-based strategies to meet and exceed clients' personal, professional, and corporate objectives. Coaching for Calm and Confidence delivers in digital format evidence-based strategies for creating calm, confidence, and successful relationships. Dr. Irwin has more than 20 years of experience as a psychologist, a business developer, and business owner. Dr. Irwin received her PhD from Temple University, completed a National Institute of Health postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, and completed a pre-doctoral internship at the Medical University of South Carolina. Dr. Irwin is Clinical Associate Professor of Psychology at, at Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, Public Relations Chair of the Executive Board of the Philadelphia Behavior Therapy Association, and a Mission Coordinator and Consultant to St. Charles Borromeo Seminary. She is also honored as a 2017 Woman of Influence for being mine today. So we're really fortunate to have her here. I personally have seen Dr. Irwin speak a few times, so I'm really happy she was able to come to our district tonight. Um, without further ado, I'd like to present Dr. Bridget Irwin. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'd like this to be as helpful and informative as possible, so feel free to ask questions. Um, in terms of advancing the slides, um, are you advancing or do you have a clicker? If you have a clicker, I'm happy to do it as well. Okay, good. So um, our uh, center, the Anxiety and OCD Center, is directed by me, and also we have an assistant director on the next slide, Dr. Erin Romer. Uh, Dr. Romer also is the director of our assessment program. So we provide at the Anxiety and OCD Center evidence-based treatment on an outpatient basis, which is what most of us think about when we think about uh, psychotherapy. Um, we also have an intensive outpatient treatment program for more severe uh, um, children, adolescents, and adults with anxiety and related disorders. We conduct assessments, so psychoeducational and psychological assessments for things like, um, you know, to support IEPs uh, and request for accommodations to clarify diagnoses. Um, we, uh, finally, we partner with an organization called the Community Volunteers in Medicine. So we seek to provide uh, effective treatment to everyone regardless of ability to pay. The Community Volunteers in Medicine services the bottom 3% of the income bracket. Um, so we really strive to disseminate effective treatment. That's a significant problem in our field, the dissemination of effective treatment across settings, uh, both among providers in terms of the training and their ability to disseminate it, and also in terms of the um, availability to uh, consumers or patients. Okay, so, so um, as I started to say, I, I prepared a brief presentation um, really covering three points. The first is what is anxiety, the distinction between stress and anxiety. So what does anxiety look like? It manifests itself very differently in different people. Um, the second is to strongly make the point that anxiety is treatable. We do have effective treatment that, um, depending on the study you look at, uh, during a, tr a trial of treatment is 75 to 85 percent effective. It creates significant improvement in 75 to 80 percent, 85 percent of the um, cases. Uh, 
treatment outcomes are best with the right supports from family and school. That's the third point that I want to make. And that becomes imperative in cases of more severe anxiety and in cases of treatment resistant anxiety. Um, there's a relatively higher rate of treatment resistance among adolescents as compared with children and adults. And treatment resistance could look anything like refusal um, or the, it also could look like um, the anxiety is so severe that it's hard to get some traction in terms of the treatment. So there are, there's uh, evidence-based um, directives that um, uh, uh, inform our practices specifically for treatment resistant cases, okay? Yeah, <laughs> okay. So for all of the psychiatric disorders, think about them as existing on a continuum. So there's a, there's a line in the sand over which we call a particular problem a disorder. But before we get to that line, it, any one of us, we all probably all have symptoms of, at, from time to time, stress and anxiety. Um, so stress is distinguished from problematic anxiety, number one, by a matter of degree, but there's also other differences between the two. Um, so the stress, feelings of stress are less severe, as I just explained. Stress is typically experienced in stressful situations. Sounds obvious, but it's, it's linked to the situation more often than a, an anxiety disorder, which can cut across situations regardless of the stress present in the current situation. Um, stress minimally interferes with activities. So two of the general criteria that make a disorder a disorder is the severity of the problem and also the degree to which it interferes or causes impairment. So with stress, it's not a disorder, so it, there would be minimal impairment as a result of stress. Uh, stress is easier to control. So you know, we typically experience it in the background, but we're able to engage in um, you know, our daily activities. Uh, thoughts and fears tend to be more realistic and situationally bound. Um, finally, reassurance is helpful. Reassurance given by parents, teachers, counselors is helpful and feels good to give. And at that point will make more sense when I talk a little bit more about anxiety. Um, so with anxiety, we, and, and particularly with anxiety disorders, we've crossed the line in the sand in terms of um, our diagnostic system. So there's going to be increased severity. The experience of anxiety is going to feel worse. Anxiety may come and go, but untreated, it gets more severe over time. So there might be gaps in the experience of it, but the waves of anxiety that um, form a trajectory towards more severe if it's untreated. Um, uh, anxiety interferes with, so there's impairment associated with anxiety. Unlike stress, there is impairment. So you'll notice, um, you know, absences from school, inability to work, inability to sleep or eat, um, excessive reassurance seeking in an unproductive way. Um, anxiety is hard to control, so the uh, efforts that the student and the parents and the teachers and the counselors implement to try to assist with the anxiety is um, they're less effective uh, if the anxiety is untreated and more severe, and especially if those, the mechanisms that the student uses are, um, some of the mechanisms are maladaptive. Avoidance is an obvious example of that, so it's, it's going to be less effective. Thoughts and fears are um, extreme. They tend to be unrealistic. For instance, with perfectionism, standards uh, might be high and rigid. And rigid. Um, Frequent and unhelpful attempts at reassurance are sought. So for the parents' experience or the counselors or the teachers, um, they might feel that the ways that they are trying to help are never enough or, or that parents might feel frustrated. And in a minute I'll describe anxiety and why that is, but there's a very different experience on the part of the um, person involved in giving help um, in the case of the anxiety disorder relative to stress. Oops, um, I think we went backwards. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So as I said at the beginning, anxiety looks different for different people. We have, first of all, we have different anxiety disorders. But second of all, anxiety is, and, and all emotions, um, thank you. Does that, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> um, are characterized by the way we think. So the, you know, the situation we're in, 
the demands of the situation, the assumptions we have, kind of all, all uh, form the cognitive uh, component of emotion. So that anxiety and all emotion is formed by the way we think, how we feel, both emotionally and physically, physiologically, and how we respond. So those three things form a feedback loop for anxiety, but they also create significant differences in how students experience anxiety. So here are some examples um, of ways in which anxiety presents. So the first is worry about many different topics. Um, generalized anxiety disorder is one of the anxiety disorders and it's really characterized by uncontrollable worry about a variety of topics. It could be anything. It tends to be daily life matters, nothing sort of outside of the ordinary of any of our lives. It's just that the anxiety and worry associated with it is excessive. Um, the second is social and performance anxiety. So social anxiety disorder is characterized by social and or performance anxiety. Um, social anxiety disorder can be very general. So, um, you know, when we think of the word shy, shyness is not a diagnosis, but it's kind of like a, you know, the word we sometimes use to describe somebody with social anxiety disorder. Uh, that might be a word that would describe somebody who is anxious across social situations, but it also can be very specific. So for instance, a student who is anxious talking with authority figures or anxiety uh, as a result of public speaking would be examples of anxiety, social anxiety that is very specific. The third is panic attacks. Um, so panic attacks have been described or panic disorder has been described as fear of fear, which um, is pretty much what it is. Um, people with panic disorder are anxious, are, are uh, experience anxiety as a result of their own physical anxiety. So I'll contrast that with a simple example of um, a child who's afraid of a dog. So the anxiety trigger in that case is the dog. Um, in the presence of a dog, the child is, is more anxious and the child might run in response to that. With panic disorder, the dog, if you will, is the, is the student's own anxiety. So any changes, any physical changes, physiological changes, and they can be very subtle. For instance, blood pressure, um, sweating, um, uh, heart rate, trigger a response, an anxiety response to those subtle changes. Now that anxiety response, of course, is going to create more changes that are not subtle anymore, which is going to create more anxiety about those physical symptoms, which then creates more physical symptoms and more anxiety about the physical symptoms, so forth and so on, such that it quickly leads to a panic attack. Um, so I just wanted to explain what panic disorder is. Panic disorder can, e or panic attacks can even occur uh, in the middle of the night while uh, people with panic attack or panic disorder are sleeping. So I, I mentioned that just to point out the, the um, sensitivity to even subtle physiological changes and um, how it becomes a conditioned response, so conditioned that it can occur in the middle of the night when the person is not conscious or awake. Um, Avoidance of situations can happen across disorders. Uh, there's a particular disorder that really is characterized by avoidance. It's called agoraphobia. And it is when people avoid situations uh, because, of a f because they fear panic attacks. Um, and again, avoidance of situations can be very specific. For instance, I don't want to give a speech at school. Um, or I don't want to go to school. <laughs> or it could be very broad. So. Uh, you know, a more severe manifestation of that would be somebody who is afraid to leave the home for fear of a panic attack. Um, the next one is anxiety after traumatic experiences. So there's, there's a, uh, an anxiety disorder called post-traumatic stress disorder. There's a couple of other disorders that kind of go along with that acute stress disorder, but just for our purposes, I'll speak about post-traumatic stress disorder. And what that is, um, is the, the, when people experience a traumatic event, there's, normal, um, there's a normal reaction that goes along with that, including you know, emotional arousal, hyperarousal, hyper exaggerated startle response. With post-traumatic stress disorder, also called PTSD, long after the traumatic event has ended, though that reaction persists. So it's the persistent reaction um, that at the time of the event was normal, right? Like if you're in a dangerous situation, all of those things that happen are normal. But the reaction to that doesn't go away after the traumatic event uh, has, has ended. That's post-traumatic str uh, stress disorder. Fear of separation, 
is um, uh, what occurs in the case of separation anxiety disorder. So separation anxiety disorder is a childhood disorder. Um, ch children grow up into adults. So um, it looks like something when the child grows up into an adult. Into adult. So some, there are manifestations of anxiety in adulthood that look very similar to separation anxiety disorder and um, uh, um, frequently adults who have those symptoms have had separation anxiety disorder as children. And finally, there's specific fears. And here's just two examples, but there's lots of examples. Dogs, um, emetophobia is a common one, so fear of vomiting. Um, we see that a lot. Uh, fear of, things like fear of heights, we don't see as much, but fear of flying, so specific fears that can cause uh, an anxiety response. So let me see if I can get going in the right direction here. Okay. OCD, up until recently, OCD was considered an anxiety disorder, formally speaking. Um, recently, our diagnostic system uh, was changed such that OCD was separated out of the anxiety disorders and now it's its own family. Um, really, for our purposes, OCD and all of the anxiety disorders function the same way and are treated the same way. We change our language a little bit with OCD. Um, and OCD does have some different, man different ways in which it expresses itself relative to the other anxiety disorders. Uh, I listed some examples, some common examples that we see at the Anxiety and OCD Center. Um, some of them we've actually, I'm sure you're all fam familiar with because we hear about them in, uh, you know, on television, um, in the media. So contamination is a common one. Um, perfectionism is maybe not all of us think of uh, I would say severe perfectionism if it falls in the OCD category. We don't think about it as OCD, but it can fall in the category, frequently falls in the category of OCD. Um, fear of harm to self or others. So uh, many uh, children and adolescents and adults with OCD have what we call intrusive thoughts, um, and they can include uh, thoughts like, what if I harm my mom? What if I harm you know, my friend? Uh, what if I harm myself? Um, and that's very different from um, uh, uh, individuals who have suicidal uh, ideation and homicidal ideation. So it's a very important distinction to make, but it's a common uh, manifestation of OCD. OCD tends to gravitate towards topics that are taboo <laughs> uh, and scary, and very scary for the individual. So that one is uh, one that we see frequently. Um, similarly, aggressive uh, obsessions, and I wrote that the child is afraid of because I'm trying to make the distinction between children who are aggressive and children who fear they might be aggressive, which is the latter of which is what we would see in the context of OCD. Religious obsessions and scrupulosity, um, intrusive sexual or inappropriate thoughts. As I said, OCD gravitates towards topics that are tab taboo. So um, the thought, what if I'm gay? is one that we commonly see among children with this form of OCD, <clears throat> which again, I mentioned that one because it's, it's to be distinguished from children who are actually questioning whether they're gay. So what if I'm gay in the context of OCD um, creates a lot of discomfort and fear and confusion, much more than you would see, there's other distinctions too, but much more than you would see from a child who is questioning that. Um, finally, there is something called not quite right OCD. And what that term was used to give a label to the experience of things not feeling right. It's a very nebulous kind of thing to describe, but certain children with OCD have the need to feel right. And it could include having a right thought, a right emotional feeling, a right physical feeling. And when they don't get that right feeling, they engage in a lot of compulsions or rituals to try to get that right feeling. Okay. I also wanted to cover two different manifestations of OCD. So, so far we've covered the, the disorders so that we're clear about kind of like the scope <clears throat> of anxiety disorders. But in our experience, in our clinical practice, there, um, regardless of disorders, so cutting across disorders, there are two very different manifestations of anxiety in children and adolescents. And I think when I go through these, you'll, you'll be familiar with, um, you'll have had experiences with, with both of them. So there is high emotion forms of anxiety. 
This is usually pretty obvious, this form of anxiety. It might include excessive worrying or temper tantrums and crying, frequent requests to go home, um, frequent requests to go to the nurse's office, school refusal, frequent tardiness or unexcused absences, and absences on significant days. There is also what we call low emotion anxiety, so internalizing, p kids who internalize. And it tends to be less obvious. They're, they tend to be very quiet or remote. Um, they might take an excessive amount of time to finish work. They might be highly perfectionistic and kind of rigid in their thinking. Um, there's more avoidance and skipping things like lunch or other responsibilities. Hoarding, by the way, is a subtype of OCD. So that occurs more in the context of low emotion, low emotional expression. Uh, there's an excessive amount of questions or reassurance seeking seen here. There's perfectionism at school, procrastination on assignments, and substance use, substance use and abuse is more common in this circumstance. Um, we see children that, I, I use the term atypical uh, perfectionists, that um, if you think of perfectionism as a vertical continuum, uh, there are children who strive to reach the standard of perfectionism and they tend to be more of the high emotion, uh, anxious children. There are other children who are equally rigid in their thinking and believe that the standards are high, but they uh, either, because they believe it's too much work, um, I'm not gonna succeed anyway, um, uh, they, they have low, as a result of that, they have low motivation and they procrastinate. So these kids are brought into our office with the presenting symptoms of low motivation, procrastination, meltdowns, refusal, anger. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of different ways that these children control in the family. The family usually walks on eggshells around them. Um, and I mean, that might be true for a lot of adolescents, but it's even more the case <laughs> in cases of children with perfectionism and atypical perfectionists. Um, so it's, it, the, uh, this is a common form of, of anxiety in children. We don't necessarily think about it as anxiety because what we see behaviorally is um, anger, withdraw, shutting down, blame. Um, but it really stems from, if you look at the core <clears throat> driving force but behind the entire problem, it stems from rigidity of thinking and um, high st perfectionistic standards. I'll come back to that when we talk about treatment. I wanted to briefly touch on school refusal versus truancy. Um, we, I mentioned something called treatment resistant anxiety and there's a whole literature that has looked at treatment resistant anxiety. Um, so uh, frequently treatment resistant anxiety uh, presents as refusal. They don't want to talk to anybody, they don't want to go anywhere for help. Um, um, the atypical perfectionists that I just described are commonly treatment resistant. Um, so school refusal would be consistent with, um, with that presentation of anxiety, and I wanted to distinguish that from truancy. So with school refusal, there is fear and anxiety associated with lots of different things, but including school. There's also um, more of an ability to, t to be able to tolerate small aspects of the school day. Uh, they, these children isolate at home. Um, they're anxious, they're isolated at home. They are likely to complete missed work. They tend to want to meet expectations and standards, so they're more likely to complete missed work. Parents frequently call them in sick <clears throat> in response to missing school. In contrast, students that are truant, thank you very much, students that are truant present very differently. They emotionally experience boredom and anger uh, as a primary emotion. There are anti antisocial behaviors. Um, so, um, you know, behaviors that are, um, uh, you know, harmful. They might bully other children. Um, you know, behaviors that kind of show a lack of empathy and compassion for other people. Uh, they tend not to stay at home. They just don't want to be at school. They want to kind of engage in other, because of the boredom and perhaps the intolerance of boredom, they want to engage in pleasure seeking activities. Um, they tend not to be motivated, therefore, to do work, <laughs> school work or, or, or uh, complete missed assignments, and they tend to hide absences from parents. 
So that's, that's an important distinction because there's sometimes some confusion about school refusal versus um, truancy. Um, uh, and um, you know, one of the driving forces really behind it, as I just explained with perfectionists and atypical perfectionists, is the, is the kind of core experience of anxiety, intense anxiety, and the desire to avoid in the context of school refusal. So students refuse school um, for several reasons, and this starts to kind of bridge over to the topic of involving uh, the family and the school in the treatment of anxiety disorders, especially in more severe cases. <clears throat> the first reason that students ref refuse school is that they receive attention from significant others outside of school. It becomes very much a behavior management situation, meaning um, um, when if you look at kind of like the function of the behavior, so for instance, the child stays home from school, the child gets more attention from others at home, um, it explains in part why the child is refusing school. So they're kind of reinforced more for not being in school in this example. They prefer to be at home with parents or caregivers. Um, secondly, they avoid school-related objects or situations that cause distress. So a reason to avoid school is if you have a presentation or you have to go to gym or there's a um, uh, sports practice that you have to engage in or some activity that causes general distress. Sometimes the distress is so severe that it, there, it occurs in activities that occur every day like lunch um, or assemblies. The distress tends to be linked with transition between classes or teachers riding the school bus, entering the school building. These are just examples because it could be lots of different things, including the ones I just mentioned, lunch and assemblies. A third reason is that escape is uncomfortable. Uh, peer interactions and performance um, situations are also uncomfortable. So difficulty in social and evaluation situations can include class participation, group or large projects, oral presentations, recitals, lunchtime, and extracurricular activities. Uh, so it's again, these are, these are other aversive, to, in the experience of the child, these are aversive situations that cause them to avoid. Um, and then finally, back to home being more reinforcing, there might be tangible reinforcement outside of the school, which has become harder and harder to control since um, um, you know, children, the dev devices, different devices that are available have proliferated. Um, you know, Wi-Fi is available at home, and so if the parents have to work, the child's at home and able to engage in some of these activities. Uh, it, but back to kind of the func understanding the function of the behavior, it is very reinforcing in those circumstances to be home, especially if school is experienced as anxiety-provoking and aversive. I wanted to spend a little bit of time on uh, physical pain. Uh, associated with anxiety since many children come to our practice um, with the experience of physical pain but might say I'm not anxious. Um, so they might have headaches or migraines or stomach aches, nausea, um, they're not able to eat, <clears throat> they have difficulty sleeping or they might actually, less common would be actually experiencing pain. Uh, that tends to be more common in adults. Um, do you remember I explained that anxiety has three different components, and all emotion has three different components. There's the cognitive, the thought component, the feeling component, and the response, the behavioral component. Um, different people are, experience emotion um, to different degrees in one of those three components. So some people are very physical with the way they experience emotion. You know, they might not have a lot of thoughts, anxious thoughts. Some children will say, I don't have any anxious thoughts. I'm not anxious, I just can't sleep. Um, or my stomach hurts, or I have a headache. That would be an example of a, of a child who experiences emotion very physically, um, but not necessarily isn't aware of or doesn't experience a significant amount of thoughts or behaviors. Um, in circumstances like that, if we can improve that child's ability to experience emotion cognitively and even behaviorally, that alone ex improves the experience of physical pain and, and and physiological anxiety. Yes? Can the fight or fl flight, to fight or flight <coughs> of heart, can that make them crash, make, make them not want to be responsive to anything, and then eventually become belligerent, and things like that? Which reminds me of what I was describing uh, with respect to um, atypical perfectionists. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so yes, absolutely. Um, 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 if, if they feel a significant amount of stress, right, so you're asking about fight or flight, so that would be stress, um, that can cause a crash. Okay. You know, so you know, the more severe the stress is and also the more rigid and, and um, uh, you know, high, high standards the child has for themselves, the more likely they are to crash. Um, and then the belligerence, mm -hmm. do you remember, you know, the response that the parents experience mm -hmm. is frequently some form of belligerence, shutting down, blame, anger. Um, that's more, the belligerence is more common, w the more rigid the child's thinking is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if, if um, you know, if a child is more flexible, they can sort of adjust to stress. And really that helps all of us, right? Like if we can adjust, like, oh, it can go this way or that way. Wasn't expecting this today. We are gonna experience less stress. But if we're, gonna, if we're rigid in our thinking and things have to go the way they have to go and I can't tolerate any change or any unexpected circumstances, we're going to experience higher, a higher degree of stress and we might even be more uh, likely to try to control the situation with things like belligerence. <laughs> Does that make sense when I'm putting the three together? That, uh, thank you for asking that because that is very, very common among the children that we see in our practice. We tend to see more severe um, uh, children and adolescents and adults, um, and so we frequently involve the parents as a result. So and the next question is yep. how, um, if, it keeps, if it's a pattern, a uh, response that they use, does, does it compound? Like, the more they, the more they have to deal with it or handle it or the response is the same, does it get worse and worse and it's harder to help the child? That's exactly how anxiety functions. Okay. And in a minute I'll talk about the, okay. the, how anxiety functions. I'll answer your question, but I'll talk more in more uh, depth about how anxiety functions um, and how it's treated. But the, the, more, the, the broad way to answer that it question is that the more that maladaptive mechanisms are used to manage anxiety, the worse the anxiety becomes. So really it's a matter of teaching adaptive functional strategies that will directly address anxiety and improve anxiety and remove the reliance upon maladaptive strategies like things like avoidance or excessive reassurance seeking. Does that yeah. make sense? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, Could you yeah. mind commenting a little more? You were starting to say that about uh, uh, someone who is experiencing the physical side of anxiety, it's better to get them to get into the more cognitive or you, are you talking about distractions or I wasn't quite sure what you meant by that. Uh, Distractions is a different topic, so I wasn't necessarily thinking distractions. I'll address that. Okay. But what I meant is um, we, have, we have, this is more common in younger children, but it also occurs in adolescents and adults in, uh, where they, there's limited insight and self-awareness. Um, so they might not be able to tell you why they're anxious, you know, what anxious thoughts they have, um, um, even what thoughts they have about anything that would create an emotional experience. That would be kind of like a more severe circumstance where somebody lacks insight. So the more that's the case, <clears throat> it's, I was gonna give you an example of, of water under three tunnels. So if the three tunnels are, th one tunnel is your thinking, your thoughts, the second is how you feel, and the third is how you respond, and now you brick up two of the tunnels, the water level is gonna rise through the existing, the, the only remaining tunnel. So that's exactly what happens with respect to physical, the physical response to anxiety and physical pain. If we can unbrick two of the tunnels, even somewhat, we can relieve some of the pressure and relieve the physical pain and physical symptoms. That doesn't describe all of what we do in treatment. That's just an initial step, really just to make the point that the more, um, the more children experience physical symptoms, the, the more they tend to lack the ability to express themselves cognitively or even behaviorally. Behaviorally, an example might be advocating for themselves. Um, um, yeah, you're welcome. <coughs> I'll just highlight here that um, kids react to danger that isn't there and parents react too because their kids are anxious and insistent. We wanna help our children. Sometimes parents are anxious when their children are anxious. I mean, that would be normal. That can also form a feedback loop between the parent and the child that I'm sure, you know, everyone who has children understands the feedback loop that creates escalation. That can also occur in the context of anxiety, escalation of emotion. Okay. <clears throat> 
Um, I made the point at the beginning that uh, just like drugs, medi you know, medications are studied uh, in clinical trials and medications are prescribed um, in such a way that um, we know this medication has been approved for this particular disorder, there are also clinical trials for psychotherapy treatments that's less well known. Um, but the NIH and other organizations fund uh, clinical trials for psychotherapy treatments. So for many of these disorders, we know what is effective. You know, we're always trying to improve our knowledge, but especially in the last 30 to 40 years, uh, the anxiety disorders and OCD in particular has experienced a sea change in terms of what we know to be effective. Probably 30, 40 years ago, antipsychotics were prescribed for um, OCD, and really there was very little to be done in, 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 uh, with respect to psychotherapy. Um, so it's important to, to seek out evidence-based treatment. Um, there are organizations, I have on the last slide, two organizations that uh, really their mission is to educate uh, consumers, a part of their mission is to educate consumers about the evidence-based interventions for different disorders. One is called the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. One is called, the other is called the um, OC Foundation, the International OC Foundation. So it's important to seek out evidence-based treatment and also providers who are trained in this treatment. Um, there's a distinction between coping strategies and treatment interventions that I'll make. Um, uh, many times coping strategies are taught, and coping strategies are good. We all need coping strategies. Really what the effect of coping strategies um, is that it takes an emotion at whatever level you know, it, it, it is, and it lowers that emotion temporarily. That's a good thing. That's not going to provide sustained treatment. So treatment interventions <clears throat> are designed to target the particular problem that is creating chronic emotion and uh, create change at that level such that emotion isn't chronic in a long-standing way, if that makes sense. So it's di distinguished from um, coping strategies. So there's, with respect to the evidence-based treatment of the anxiety disorders, there's a lot of literature, extensive literature, supporting something called cognitive behavioral treatment. Are you all familiar with cognitive behavioral treatment? It really is a very large umbrella term to refer to the first line treatment for a lot of different disorders. And the cognitive part just refers to the fact that the way we think and the appraisals we make matter, right? They're, they're part of why when we're anxious, they're part of why we're anxious. Um, the behavioral part targets the person's response to their anxiety. So in the case of chronic anxiety, problematic anxiety, uh, these responses become um, uh, you know, maladaptive responses become used repetitively. It's almost like the example of pain. If the pain is not so bad, we can kind of make it through our day and not change how we behave. But if pain is more severe, we're going to start to react to the pain. We might limp or sit down or lie down. It's going to start to change our behavior. So the behavioral component of cognitive behavioral treatment targets the ways in which our emotional reaction changes our behavior. For the anxiety disorders, um, there's a specific kind of cognitive behavioral treatment. I mentioned that CBT, cognitive behavioral treatment, is a large umbrella term. There's a specific kind of cognitive behavioral treatment for actually lots of different disorders, including depression, um, Tourette's disorder, tic and Tourette's disorder. There's something called trichotillomania, which is hair pulling. So there are specific kinds of CBT interventions for disorders like that and for anxiety disorders. The one for anxiety disorders is called exposure with response prevention, and I'll explain shortly what that is. Um, so this slide just lists the uh, evidence for the effectiveness of uh, exposure with response prevention in both adults uh, and children. Recently, uh, relatively speaking, in 2004, there was a study that came out of Penn called the POTS study. That was a very significant study that provided a lot of evidence, significant amount of evidence supporting exposure with response prevention and also looked at the role of medication in the treatment of anxiety and OCD. Um, cognitive behavioral treatment with or without medication is more effective than medication alone. Many people don't want their children on medication, but there are people who want to just seek out medication without psychotherapy. So there have been studies that have looked at that. Medication will 
uh, the, the first line medication treatments for the anxiety disorders are the SSRIs, the antidepressants. That stands for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And really the effect of those is that it takes a, the, an emotion at whatever level and it lowers it as long as you're on the medication and as long as the medication's working for you. If you go off the medication, it'll just go right back up. So that's actually pretty helpful, <laughs> um, but it's not going to permanently treat the underlying problem. And it's not necessary to treat the underlying problem except in the most severe cases of anxiety. Um, yes? So you're not including depression in any of this. You're looking at anxiety as a standalone right. and not as a component <coughs> of depression. And many of the research studies, unless they say otherwise, isolate particular disorders. So they, when, when there's a research study, for instance, um, the POTS study or other research studies that have looked at the treatment of OCD, they select people, there's selection criteria, so they select people with, for instance, just OCD and no other disorder. The selection criteria is different for different studies, but they, it, they really don't want confounding variables that make it hard to say, hey, this treatment works, and so a confounding variable might be a comorbid disorder, right? Comorbid disorder means it's a, another disorder that goes along with the first disorder. So one of the downsides of these research studies is it's not real life, right? Like in real life, there's a lot of comorbidity. The word comorbidity means you have multiple disorders. So in real life, there's a high rate of comorbidity. Uh, in these research studies, they don't want a lot of comorbidity because they want to see whether this treatment works. Um, there are studies that have looked at the effectiveness of these treatments for comorbid problems. And it, um, um, with depression, I'll just briefly address depression for a second. With depression, a, the most common manifestation of depression in the context of an anxiety disorder um, is, the, is that the depression is experienced really um, as a consequence of high anxiety. Um, so we can even see that in maybe less severe circumstances if we're anxious about something in our own lives. You know, there's a particular you know, life-changing event. Uh, we might feel anxious and then we might feel depressed afterwards or down a bit. That occurs in a more significant way for people with anxiety disorders. So bouts of anxiety are followed by de bouts of depression. And that's very different from depression that is experienced no matter what. Right? No matter whether things are good or bad, I'm depressed. That's a different kind of depression. So that's good news that the more common manifestation is that it's a consequence of anxiety because it helps us kind of target our resources towards the anxiety. We treat the depression as well, but really if we're gonna you know, target resources, we wanna treat the anxiety so that it improves not only the anxiety but also the depression. Okay. So looking, let me just make sure I'm on the right slide. Uh, looking at the POTS study, um, which looked at children and adolescents with OCD, the recommendations that have, have come from that study are that children and adolescents with OCD should start with either CBT or alone, alone or the combination of CBT and medication. So I'm, I'm including this slide just so that we can look at what does the research say about what's effective for anxiety. So either CBT alone or the combination of CBT and medicine. Family involvement in the treatment of pediatric OCD is necessary. We'll come back to why I've mentioned that a couple of times. We'll come back to that. Therapist experience matters. That's the point I was making before when I talked about the distinction between coping strategies and effective treatment strategies. Um, you know, one of the sort of um, uh, uh, problems in our field, and, and, and there have been a lot of interventions that have tried to target the problem of disseminating effective treatments to provide to the you know providers broadly it tends to be less of a problem in the medical field so when there's new um, treatments available they the, the dissemination tends to be quicker than in the mental health field so therapist experience matters okay so in the next um, group of slides, I'm going to talk about direct treatment of the child, but the reason I label this section direct treatment of the child is I'd also like to talk about how do we include the family and the school in the treatment of uh, anxiety disorders in, in children and adolescents. So let me take this opportunity to explain how anxiety works. Um, so I use the example of pain, you know, when pain is, you know, I talked about stress and anxiety, so when pain is mild, it doesn't really create a maladaptive response, we 
make it through the day. When it's more severe, it starts to affect our behavior. <laughs> anxiety is no different. So just to define terms briefly, a trigger of anxiety is anything that causes anxiety. The word obsession in the, in, for, in the context of obsessive compulsive disorder is really just a trigger of anxiety. It's anything that triggers anxiety, and really it can be anything. It could be a thought, uh, a memory, a feeling. It could be a circumstance the person encounters. Um, so um, examples include, what if I'm imperfect? Um, I feel shame. What if the dog bites me? To use a simple one, the trigger in that case would be the dog, like I said. Then down at the bottom, the terms response, ritual, and compulsion are all synonyms. Just like trigger and obsession are synonyms, response, ritual, and compulsion are synonyms. <clears throat> so if the anxiety is severe, the child's going to have a response to the anxiety. So if there's a dog that comes into the room and the child's afraid of dogs, the child's going to run from the dog. We would call that a response. We would also call it a ritual. Um, in the context of OCD, the word compulsion is used to refer to the person's response to the obsession. So here I define these terms as um, any thought or action that a person feels driven to perform and which causes anxiety to suddenly decrease. So this sort of like quick decrease in anxiety is the characteristic experience of using a compulsion or ritual. So for instance, if the child runs from the dog and gets away, he's going to be more quickly relieved of the anxiety than if he's staying around the dog. Um, other examples would include trying to be perfect or to achieve high standards. Um, avoidance or school refusal is a common one. And those tend to be pretty fixed, right? I mean, being afraid of dogs, you're usually afraid of dogs always until you work on the issue. But like with the perfectionism, it's not as if the kid um, like kind of ruminates on the issue of not being perfect one day and then the next day picks something else to kind of fixate on. It varies. Yeah, that's a good question. So for some people with anxiety, their anxiety triggers are relatively fixed. Right? So perfectionism would be a good example of a circumstance where the anxiety triggers tend to be fixed. With OCD in particular, that's actually an excellent example of uh, circumstances where the anxiety disorders are not, there. the anxiety triggers are not fixed. So um, they kind of morph like video game characters. Um, you know, f maybe today it's, it's an intrusive thought about one thing and tomorrow that doesn't bother me, but two other things show up. And then those go away and three other things show up. So there are, there are different anxiety disorders in which the trigger really kind of morphs and changes over time. And that's why I haven't gotten to this yet, but um, there are core obsessions or core triggers that do persist over time, core kind of concepts or ideas or things that the child doesn't tolerate well that do persist over time. It's kind of like an onion, like what we see on the surface might shift around, but at the core, it tends not to shift. So if we can target treatment interventions at the core, we can provide more lasting gains than if we we're just putting out fires on the outside. Um, okay. So when, an, when anxiety is triggered, so you know, I just defined triggers of anxiety or obsessions. When anxiety is triggered, the person engages in an unhelpful, and I use the term avoidance here, but it's not always avoidance. Um, uh, the, the, behavioral is no, the behavior is not always avoidance, but it's an avoidance response, meaning they're trying to avoid anxiety. So they want to alleviate the anxiety. Uh, these unhelpful avoidance responses are called rituals or compulsions, as I said. And rituals do, think about the simple, I like the simple example of a child who's afraid of a dog, so you can really clearly see how anxiety functions, because in the real world, world, anxiety is much more nebulous. It's harder. Think about worry, you know, generalized anxiety disorder and worry and thoughts. It's really hard to pinpoint, wait, what's the trigger and what's the response? So if we take the example of a child who's afraid of a dog um, and he runs, he feels better. <laughs> Not only does he feel less anxious, but he's relieved of his fears. His thought, you know, the thoughts associated with his fears are relieved. We're wired to alleviate discomfort. Right? So that these children are doing things that we're all wired to do. Um, they tend to have, you know, obviously there's a genetic predisposition to anxiety, so they might have a more, they might be more sensitive to anxiety or new situations and have a more severe experience of anxiety. Um, 
rituals are therefore used repeatedly to alleviate anxiety. So think about if, if you could picture a graph with just a series of bell curves, that really characterizes chronic anxiety. So um, the, you know, moving up the one side of the first bell curve is the trigger of anxiety. So the dog triggers anxiety, the child runs. So two things are reinforced there. Number one, um, when he runs, the trigger is reinforced. So meaning the, the fact that dogs are dangerous and to be avoided. So we've just reinforced the fear <laughs> by running. But secondly, we've reinforced the utilization of avoidance or running as the way to alleviate the fear. So it creates this, this um, kind of cyclical re um, reinforcement pattern that, you know, if you picture it on a bell curve, the next time he encounters a dog, he's anxious, he runs, he's anxious, he runs, he an he's anxious, runs. So in the case of chronic anxiety, you know, that bell curve is going to elevate his anxiety over time, the series of bell curves, but it really is made up of a back and forth between the trigger response, trigger response, trigger response. And these responses, these rituals, Remember, they're maladaptive. There's helpful ones that we teach them. But that really describes, if that makes sense, that describes the nature of chronic um, uh, problematic anxiety. Over time, importantly, rituals become less effective and they need to be relied upon more as the disorder progresses. So early on, rituals tend to be effective. Reassurance seeking from parents, um, avoidance, oh, I feel better, I can go tomorrow. Over time, they become less effective. So, you know, I, I can't go at all, or I need more and more and more reassurance. Um, um, so the, they're momentary, it's, it's like putting uh, suntan lotion on your sunburn. It makes it feel better, but it may not get worse. But in this particular case, yeah. you're saying that it, it actually could just build and the next time, because it's reinforced each time. Right. Exactly. Okay. And it's interesting you use the sunburn example. I usually use the poison ivy example that, no, ma sunburn, no, but sunburn, that's a good one. <laughs> but it does get feel better, right? It feels better, but we haven't fixed, but we po haven't fixed it. poison ivy, no matter what it itches, right? Like an anxious kid, no matter what you're anxious, no matter what it itches, I want to scratch it because when I scratch it, it feels better. But when I stop scratching it, I have now have red and inflamed poison ivy that spreads. <laughs> that's a metaphor that we frequently use to describe anxiety. Yes. Um, behaviors used in rituals, this is an important point, are not inherently wrong. So obviously reassurance seeking or avoidance is sometimes good. <laughs> um, it's the, what's unhelpful about these rituals is the fact that they are used compulsively, meaning I need to, I can't not, to alleviate fear. So anything can be a ritual. That's an, an important distinction. They're not inherently wrong. It's just the utilization of of that strategy, whatever the strategy is, compulsively out of fear in a, in a repetitive way is what's maladaptive. And really the, the main point is that the child is never learning to tolerate the anxiety trigger. There's, there's constant avoidance of the anxiety trigger. Um, so here I say, just as an example, hand washing um, is not inherently bad. Um, we are a lot healthier now than in the Middle Ages because we wash our hands. But many hours of repetitive hand washing out of fear to alleviate fear uh, obviously is unhelpful. So it's not the hand washing, it's the use of the hand washing to alleviate my fear. But the, the initial hand washing works to alleviate the fear. Exactly. It's just that the fear response increases, so you need to increase how much hand washing you're doing now to get rid of that anxiety. Exactly. Exactly. And OCD in particular, that's an OCD example. The more the disorder progresses, the more unrealistic the fear triggers become. So OCD is slightly different from the other anxiety disorders in a couple of ways. That's one way that it tends, the particular fear uh, triggers or thoughts uh, tend to be less realistic. An example might be if I have a bad thought, uh, my mom might die. That's not realistic, but it can be extremely anxiety provoking for, for a child. Uh, with contamination, if I washed my hands, you know, initially it might be relieving, but months to years down the line, I wash my hands, there's a what if I didn't wash them well enough? Or what if I touch that after I wash my hands and then, um, you know, I'm recontaminated? So that it progresses. Um, problematic anxiety waxes and wanes over the course of a person's life. Children, many times for years, uh, might be fine the parents might report that the child was fine with no anxiety for years, 
but all of a sudden in ninth grade <laughs> or 10th grade, we have, they experience a resurgence of anxiety. Um, and as we talked about before, it plays whack-a-mole, so it kind of morphs and um, the specific triggers may shift. So we've covered this, that when rituals are relied upon, um, anxiety increases over time and it spreads to new situation, so, situations so that the overall number of situations that are affected increases. There, there are many more triggers over time. Importantly, the child does not learn when he uses or she uses a ritual that anxiety comes and goes on its own. I'll talk about normal emotion in a minute and also that feared consequences are highly unlikely but, but they can handle them if they happen. Some, sometimes, um, you know, in, in the implementation of CBT, um, it's sometimes taught incorrectly that the goal of treatment here is to prove that the bad thing won't happen. We don't have that luxury. <laughs> you know, so anxiety focuses on things that can happen. They're all bad and they can happen. Um, uh, they tend to be, you know, low likelihood, um, but, um, you know, really what we want to help people do is to be able to have these feared consequences, which may be extreme, be less relevant in the context of their lives and have them react less out of them, right? So they're better able to tolerate these feared, the possibility, uncertainty associated with these feared outcomes. Normal emotion, if you think about back to the bell curve, um, picture another graph with, you know, kind of like a, a bell curve that subsides and doesn't, doesn't kind of um, include uh, anxiety becoming triggered again. Normal emotion is that. We experience emotion in different situations and it comes and goes. We don't necessarily respond to remove, to eliminate the emotion. We're able to respond according to the demands of the situation. So an example might be a test or a quiz. If I'm anxious, it would be normal to be anxious, right? But if it, we're talking about normal emotion, anxiety is operative in the background and actually good because it makes me care and study. Um, and I'm able to you know, engage, study for the test, engage in the test, anxiety might increase, peak, and taper off and without, with, with uh, little negative impact. That's normal emotion. Grief also, sadness and grief. Um, you know, something happens, we, we um, have experienced a loss of a loved one, a loss of a student, like I know this district has. There's grief that is experienced as a result of that, and eventually the grief subsides we might be re-triggered again and subsides. That's normal uh, emotion. Um, the goals of treatment are two. So back to the thoughts, feelings, and actions associated with emotion. We want to help create lower anxiety, obviously. We want the, the, the emotional and the physical experience of anxiety to improve. <coughs> and um, also to improve gr the tolerance of the specific fears, right? So that, you know, um, uh, these fears are low likelihood, they may happen, I can handle them. So this slide just tries to depict, you know, the, this er the thing that I don't tolerate well. It might be the, the, the f fear that I might lose a loved one, it might be the fear of negative evaluation at school, um, it might be, a, you know, panic symptoms. Um, it, this slide pulls apart the different components of anxiety, the emotional symptoms, the thoughts, and the behavior, and describes how anxiety, it's, it's this kind of a similar depiction um, to the one that I used in terms of the bell curves. It describes how anxiety forms this cyclical process that increases over time. Um, with respect to treatment goals, um, before I talk about this slide, th the uh, treatment of anxiety, as I said, it improves the tolerance and the experience of anxiety. It would, a, a metaphor to, ex to explain that is if we put our foot in cold water and, and we leave our foot in cold water, the experience of cold subsides. And the same thing is true with emotion. So when we, on, in contrast, if we put our foot in and out of cold water, the experience of cold persists. So that term that describes the fact that the cold feeling and the, the emotion subsides is called habituation. That's one of the goals of treatment. The second goal of treatment is that our thinking shifts. So if I run from every single dog I encounter, I'm gonna have more extreme thoughts about dogs. 
right? And I, I have no experience with actually handling a dog because I run from all of them. So I'm gonna have pretty polarized thinking. If on the other hand, I, I practice, you know, we don't take the kids to the pound on the first day. We start easy. You, you can't learn if you're highly anxious. You have to start easy with easy goals. Um, and I have the experience of, let's just say I bring a puppy in the room and I don't run and I sit with the puppy and I'm somewhat anxious but I can handle it. I've now created learning. I'm able to, I have learned that I'm able to handle at least this puppy. That's a, that's a baby step, but it's a step. Over time, these steps add up to flexibility of thinking that includes the fact that I can handle different dogs. Yes, there's dangerous dogs, but you see my thinking has become more flexible and less focused on extreme outcomes. So here what is depicted is the fact that there are easy and medium and difficult goals. When parents bring their kids into treatment, they are not bringing their kids in for the easy goals. They're bringing their kids in because there's difficult situations that they can't surmount. Um, so those difficult situations, we call them highly relevant <laughs> because they're creating significant problems. Um, like the child won't go to school, won't get on the bus, um, won't, you know, doesn't have friends. Um, so there's significant problems. Maybe there's a lot of anger and belligerence, outbursts at home. Um, those difficult problems have easier and medium manifestations. Those easy and medium manifestations are less relevant, right? Kind of they go together. That's, you know, it makes sense that if they're easy, they're not creating as much interference. So we don't care about them as much. And if we only had them, we wouldn't be in treatment. We care about them very much because they as I said, it's very difficult to learn if a child is highly anxious. Um, so they are excellent avenues through which <clears throat> we can um, access uh, whatever factors are making the difficult, highly relevant situations as difficult as they are. So we can, at, we can access them. They're avenues through which we can create change. And what's nice about that is what typically happens is that the difficult goals become easier before we even get there. Um, now, sometimes it's helpful and necessary to work on the difficult goals right away. That's, you know, we, we don't have the luxury of waiting. And so we do that, um, but we don't ignore these easy to medium goals because they're, they're our greatest weapon against anxiety. Yes? So as parents, how do we get an adolescent or a young adult to understand that they're not alone and that they might need some treatment? Some mm -hmm. Right. So, That's called um, treatment resistance, by the way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> how does one, how do you suggest that if there's parents out there with students that might meet some of those criteria, how do we right. get do you them in the car? Do you remember I talked about the feedback loop between the parent and the child, right? Um, parents, and, and this is part of what I'm going to cover as well, but thank you for asking the question. Parents necessarily play a role um, in, you know, in the lives of all of our children, um, when we have an anxious child, the parent is responding in some way to that anxious child. So in the case of treatment resistance, treatment resistance again is the child won't go. And by the way, many do, many come and you know, talk with us and work with us. But we do, as I said, we see more severe um, children and adolescents in our practice. So there are some who, who don't or who have said five words to me in a year, right? <laughs> um, uh, it is imperative to include the parent and with consent the school. So I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that there's a, there's a, a whole research literature that is focused on how to treat treatment resistant anxiety disorders. And one of the biggest factors is including the parents in the school. The other factors that go along with that is because of the severity and the resistance right, to treatment, um, it tends to pull for reactions. So the child's anxiety tends to pull specific reactions from family members and school personnel that tend to be in either the over-accommodating or under-accommodating category. Um, so I guess my point here is that there are ways in which we can intervene with the parents to help create and promote improvement in the child and even motivation. Um, and also, the second point is, it's actually very necessary to do that in the case of treatment resistance. Uh, over accommodations, I'll just reiterate this, over accommodating and under accommodating treatment resistant anxiety is the biggest predictive variable. 
So if we don't correct it, these, those children have very poor outcomes. If we do correct it, the over-accommodating and under-accommodating, I'll give you an example in a minute of what I mean there, we have, we have very good outcomes in terms of treatment. So an example of over-accommodating is the walking on eggshells around the child. You know, whatever the child wants, like let's just do it because we have to get out, and it might be realistic, like you can't do anything or get out the door if we don't kind of, um, you know, alleviate this child's anxiety. That can form, that can form into a pattern of over-accommodation in, in a family. Under accommodating would be just get in the car and do it, right? That would be under accommodating. Um, one of the points here with this, this slide is that we have very different goals depending on how difficult the situation is. And right here I use the term accommodations. This is like a little bit of a segue off your question, but it's an important point. I use the term accommodations to, to highlight the fact that when we're working in very difficult situations, and even children here who have 504s or IEPs, need accommodations, they're meant to level the playing field um, such that that child is evaluated <clears throat> um, you know, in a way that is unencumbered by the disorder, evaluated based on their aptitude. Um, uh, but it's also, it's, you know, they're also necessary um, uh, in order to, be, to effectively treat anxiety. I, I use the example of not taking the child to the pound on the first day. Um, we can't effectively treat anxiety if the child is so highly anxious that they can't learn or uh, functionally be in a situation. So, you know, it would be okay to accommodate and say, look, we'll put the dog in the basement at your friend's house until we get to that level of, of treatment. So um, those accommodations are actually very important. It's just that, back to your question, in the context of families, that the child's anxiety pulls for extremes that need to be corrected. So does that make sense, my answer, that we need to, how do you get a kid in the car? Um, we need to involve, if the child really will not come, we have to involve the parents, and it's very effective to involve the parents. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Yeah. And it's just harder when you have older kids. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. On the other side of that, yeah. which I was going to ask a question is, well, I mean, we're talking about pretty concrete anxiety triggers. Mm-hmm in your examples, because yeah. it helps us see what you're talking about. Yeah. But one of the other things you mentioned way back at the beginning was what the panic attack thing. Yes. Which is hard to identify what the trigger is, because exactly. the child or the adult or whoever is experiencing doesn't know what it is that originated it. And, and that's that's difficult, because I, I, I feel like that this is where I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble figuring out where would the treatment, how does the treatment work? Because they, unless you put them on some kind of monitor that says, oh, you're experiencing this and your heart rate has just, it just started climbing mm -hmm. and you, you haven't been doing anything. And that's the one that I'm, it's, it's easy when, when they're concrete, it's a fear of a dog or that's right. whatever. But you're right. Like, so I'm interested in, how this works with like panic yeah I guess and it's that, a good it is a good question good? the reason I give the example of the dog as I said is it's very simple and right. concrete so you could see the fact that it's unhelpful to run all the time right, right? Um, anxiety is typically not that easy right, right? it's very nebulous so um, there are behavioral rituals right so or manifestations of anxiety but most of anxiety occurs in our thoughts yeah. so you can't see our thoughts right. right you can't see your child's thoughts right. um, so it's, um, we like to start with behavioral rituals. So even in the case of panic, yeah. there are circumstances that are more likely to trigger panic than others. Um, it might be things like extra, it's different for different people. These are just examples. So it could be exercise, things that kind of create physiological arousal, yeah. um, caffeine, exercise, crowded hallways, heat, getting hot or sweaty, um, not sitting near the door, sitting in the middle of a movie, like a row of seats at the movie theater sitting in the middle. So there are circumstances that make the person with panic more likely to get anxious. Um, so they trigger the internal, the body, the, 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 physical the physical symptoms physical. of anxiety, yes. Um, and there might be other circumstances that are harder to identify. Um, we like to start with the behavior because they're easy to know. You know whether you did it or not. Uh, but there are thoughts. Our, our main goal is to get to the point where we're, hand, we're addressing the thoughts. That bell curve, you know, I use the other graph to depict like the, the cycle of anxiety. 
is what characterizes chronic worry. So that trigger and response pattern can exclusively occur in your thoughts. You know, you think about the example of a chronic worrier who sits and worries, worries, worries. They're not doing anything behaviorally, uh, but in their thoughts, they're engaged in that worry. You know, it might not look like, it might or feel like chronic, or a, you know, a back and forth. It might feel chronic, but there is a back and forth in terms of trigger response, trigger response. Right. That's our goal to, to affect change there okay. because that forms the foundation of anxiety that then eventually, you know, when anxiety is worse, expresses itself behaviorally. Right. Did that answer your question? Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. yeah. Right. Which makes the anxiety go up, which is why I don't want to go to treatment. So which it happens. Becomes, <laughs> it becomes a matter of trying to calm that fear that you're not taking away this blanket, so to speak. Right. To find a different way to, to handle it. Yeah, and I'll go back to the point. We, we see a lot of the most severe, um, you know, children and adolescents. Many people who come to us have been to other, uh, other uh, providers, and um, maybe they haven't been able to help at that level of severity, um, or the or the child just hasn't been helped, right? Um, so we will frequently um, um, have uh, children and adolescents or parents come to us with the complaint that the child actually won't come, won't talk, um, is afraid of uh, having the rituals removed. Some people are even more extreme, um, such that they are afraid of all treatment. They actually kind of trust the, this is usually the case in OCD, by the way, but they kind of trust the OCD. The OCD keeps me safe, right? So I don't want you to take that away. I want to consistently avoid or wash or get reassurance. Um, it's really in those circumstances, it's a sign of greater rigidity of thinking, which um, think, think about kind of two continua. One is the severity of anxiety, and the other is the degree to which the person has rigidity in their thinking. That's, the term for that is fixity of beliefs. So some people are real flexible with their thinking and other people are real rigid with their thinking. So in these examples, there tends to be greater rigidity, especially in the case of I'm afraid to treat my OCD or my anxiety. So it's a separate problem, if you will. Um, it's, I'll call it a barrier to treatment. Treatment is highly effective. There are absolutely in real, the real world, there's barriers and that's, that's one of them that has to be addressed um, because if it's not addressed, we're gonna have ineffective treatment. <clears throat> um, so, and I'll reiterate the point that it is, it is difficult with older children if they don't want to come. Uh, many children, in my experience, the children who don't want to come are willing to come, but we also have children who won't come, they refuse, um, or won't talk when they come. So I, I really did have a one student, high school student, who said probably five words to me in a year and came to every appointment. <laughs> um, in those circumstances, it's imperative to, to treat the family, and even in those cases, the school is usually involved. Um, and, and through addressing the ways in which the parents and the schools are supporting the child, uh, sometimes in helpful ways and sometimes in ways, like I talked about over accommodating and under accommodating, sometimes in ways that are you know, essentially um, you know, enabling the disorder. So if we're able to address you know, uh, target interventions at those two levels, we can uh, facilitate treatment directly with the child. So this, this right here, if you remember, was the direct treatment of the child. So that's the ideal, that we have, we have um, compliance there. I think the, I think the, um, the uh, laptop just maybe ran out of batteries or something. Is that clear? So, you know, the, the, those are two barriers. There are other barriers of treatment as well. Um, the other, Good, thank you. The other aspect of this slide, let me just see. I think I made this point, but let me just reiterate. Um, with difficult goals, the treatment interventions are different. There's absolutely accommodations. I mentioned coping. Coping is necessary but not sufficient. It's very helpful with very difficult goals. So if you think about a child in crisis, we're not treating anything now. We're trying to get through the crisis. So we actually need coping. 
um, and crisis management. When the child is calmer, um, and if we have you know, the luxury of having them in treatment, we can target the easier and medium goals with specific treatment interventions like I described. So this is where the treatment, the improvement of the disorder occurs, but we may be constantly moving back and forth between crisis management and treatment. And that's okay, that, uh, that tends to happen at the beginning of treatment before we've made, we've created some traction. Um, um, but this is an, an, an important point, the ability to have the flexibility to move back and forth. So here maybe more directly addresses some of what I already described, but the question about um, what do you do when your child doesn't want treatment? Um, so an obvious point, but I'll just state it, that anxiety symptoms are observed in the family in the school settings, right? Um, so there's, it's like a pebble in a pond. There's ripple effects across settings. Um, <clears throat> the successful treatment of childhood anxiety disorders necessitates broadening treatment to include interventions with the family and the school to treat factors that function to maintain the anxiety. So even in, in mild cases, mild to moderate cases of anxiety, the parents are necessarily involved in um, you know, the, the experience of anxiety in the child, the, the, the reassurance seeking right, strategies that are used with the child. So it's very important to teach the parents um, helpful strategies the, stra the parenting, this, uh, we have this whole separate presentation on the parenting that is um, helpful in the context of anxiety disorders. The parenting is very different at times. Um, the parenting that needs to be used for anxiety disorders is very different from what we typically think of as parenting strategies that we use with our children. So um, it's important to include the parents at least um, so that the parents understand what the helpful strategies are and they can reinforce them and use them at home. As I explained before with that, with that question um, that was asked about children who are treatment resistant, they, children with anxiety disorders typically receive too much or too little help from their families, the over accommodation and under accommodation. And, and really that comes from not knowing what to do and maybe at times feeling desperate um, to help our children function when they're not functioning. Um, so increased, uh, the research literature has, has studied this phenomenon, and um, I included some findings here. Increased parental anxiety is associated with too much or too little help in the family. So what that means is the more that the parents are anxious, the more they're going to be under accommodating or over accommodating. And, um, the parents who tend to be anxious are gonna be obviously even more anxious when they have an anxious child who is refusing treatment. Giving too much or too little help is strongly and consistently correlated with symptom severity and impairment. That's the point I made before. It's a strong predictor, which is actually good news because we can't control our children, but we can control ourselves. Like if we know what strategies work and are helpful, we have direct control over that. So this is good news. Um, you know, there, it's strongly and consistently correlated. You could view that in the negative direction or the positive direction, right? In a positive way, correlated with symptom severity and impairment. Using appropriate help or accommodations is associated with significant improvement in anxiety symptoms and should be targeted in clinical care. Again, these points are coming from research studies. <clears throat> Findings, look how many of them. Um, so too much or too little help in the family, these are examples. Excessive help with avoidance. Uh, excessive provision of reassurance. I use that example a lot because it's a really common one. And as I said at the very beginning of the talk, it's the parent's experience of excessive anxiety-driven reassurance is usually um, frustration um, and desperation. Like they know it's not working. You know, it doesn't feel like normal parental reassurance that feels good and loving. It feels frustrating. Um, uh, help with anxiety rituals. So I'll wash that for you. Um, you know, would be an example of help with anxiety rituals. Or I'll do the homework for a child who wants to do homework per perfectly. I'll do the homework. So you know, but in an excessive way, excessively helping with anxiety rituals. Decreased behavioral expectations of the child. So you know, I'm not going to ask my child to do X, Y, or Z because I just need them to get to school and get their homework done. Again, the decreased behavioral expectations would be extreme relative to a child without an anxiety disorder. 
modification of family routine and activities. We can't go there because this makes the child, this is like the walking on eggshells, like that makes the child anxious or we have to leave now or you know, we can't be late or I have to make sure I have all his soccer gear because then he's gonna be anxious on the soccer field. So modification of the routine as a result of the anxiety, look at how much the anxiety can kind of govern the um, you know, family functioning. And modification of the family routine, that's also in a sense not holding the child accountable exactly. for getting that soccer stuff together on his own. Exactly. And that so would so Yeah, it was so that would be modification but also you know, helping the child achieve bailing them out. Yeah, bailing them out. <laughs> mm-hmm. Anxiety response. Mm-hmm. Um, so too many or too few accommodations can be in, observed in school settings at times as well. So anxiety can look like refusal or other behavioral problems and this is especially in younger children where there's, there might be some confusion about whether it's, you know, the term is behavioral, it just means like they're acting out, they're just refusing, um, and, you know, it might not be apparent that the child is anxious. One of, the, one of the criteria of anxiety that you'll notice, and if you look at the childhood anxiety disorders, it'll say, this disorder, when it presents itself in a child, might look very behavioral. <laughs> it might look refusal, like refusal, or there's tantrums. Um, so, so it kind of contributes to the confusion. Um, Accommodations can be overutilized, which um, is associated with worse treatment outcomes. So, that that example, you know, when we when we uh, advocate for 504s or, or IEPs, ideally they're flexible. So this is just an example of accommodations that might be overutilized. Those those accommodations, ideally, in the case of emotional distress, are flexible. And as we create improvement, the accommodations are modified um, to account for the improvement. But in circumstances where accommodations are overutilized, um, uh, so examples there might be, you know, consistently for years, you know, the child leaves class whenever the one child wants to leave class because they're anxious and it's not, you know, um, there, there aren't kind of treatment interventions put in place. I'm just giving you, I'm making this example up. That would be an example of an accommodation that's, that's overutilized in the, in the school setting. Um, you might all know what this is, but the 504 plan or individualized education plans, these are examples of, of accommodations, and I wrote at the top temporary. Sometimes they're not temporary, they're, they're permanent, but as I said, ideally we want them to be flexible. We don't want them there. You know, we want to teach the children tolerance of these situations that cause anxiety, not, you know, um, uh, not, um, um, you know, have the accommodation be in place at the expense of helping them tolerate these situations. Um, so these are just supports and services. They, they, it allows for supports and services to help students. Um, it's based on individual case conceptualization. Um, it's important to follow the premise of gradual exposure, as I explained in the context of anxiety. Um, uh, as I said, it needs to be flexible um, and meet the needs of the current student. Ideally, there's a tracking progress and there's modifications of accommodations. That's kind of built into the IEP but not necessarily the 504. Um, and I think these are some resources that I mentioned um, at the top, the Anxiety and Depression Associ Association of America and the OC Foundation are two organizations that have excellent resources, um, information um, uh, about um, um, different disorders, about how they function. So it's a great, it's a great resource for consumers. And I'm happy to entertain any questions. Yes? So which does the CBT involve? I mean, are there certain types of treatment therapy for different disorders? Or is there a certain evalu uh, evaluation process? Or yeah. So CBT, there are different, slightly different kinds of CBT interventions for different disorders. There's a CBT for depression, for instance. Um, and what it involves for anxiety uh, is um, understanding, there needs to be an assessment, right, so that we understand what the disorder is. And as I talked about the, the scale, the, the range of easy to medium to hard triggers of anxiety, um, it then involves um, uh, teaching the child um, and this is, again, back to the question about treatment resistance. Ideally, I'm going to answer this question as it relates to a compliant child. 
um, <laughs> teaching the child um, awareness of their specific anxious thoughts. You know, so in a, in a situation that makes me anxious, so let's say it's getting on the school bus or, um, uh, you know, presenting in class or interacting with friends, what are the anxious thoughts associated with that? And what is your anxious response? What is the, you know, the ritual? So the ritual might be avoidance, for instance. So teaching self-awareness, you know, so that the nebulous experience of anxiety is, a, the child is able to compartmentalize that experience into, you know, what the way they think, the way they feel, and how they respond. So we're kind of deconstructing anxiety. And that forms the, the building blocks, the foundation with which we can ha have them practice behavioral exercises. So that's the behavioral part of CBT. The first part's the cognitive part. What am I afraid of? The second part is a behavioral part. Instead of running, can I practice, like I'll use my simple example again, if I'm afraid of a dog, I'll bring a puppy in and I'll res I won't run, I'll sit in the room with a puppy. That's a behavioral exposure um, with um, children with you know, other anxiety disorders it might include tolerance of imperfection. That would be a behavioral exercise ex or exposure. Um, um, that seems a lot harder to treat, putting someone to bed who's okay with a small imperfection instead of a larger one. I mean, that seems. <laughs> Perfectionism is hard to treat. Be yeah. and, and again, th think back to what I said before. There's anxiety, and then there's this whole other continuum of rigidity of thinking. Yeah. And the reason why perfectionism is harder is because they're rigid in their thinking. They're not willing to, I'm just giving an example of an exposure, but you're very right. It is, it's just, it's a barrier. So it does make it harder only because we're working on two things. Um, it be, it's necessary because if, I, you know, if you remember at the beginning I was talking about rigidity, if, you're, if someone's rigid and they need things to go a certain way, you're going to be highly anxious. Right? Like if you can't tolerate it any other way, you're going to be highly anxious. So it's, in very, it's imperative to target um, the rigidity of thinking. But you're right, perfectionism is, is more challenging. But tolerance, some kids, believe it or not, they do very well with, um, not all kids are equally rigid. So some kids do very well with tolerating exposures that would include tolerating perfectionism or flexibility or a change of plans. These are behavioral exposures. Um, um, not knowing the plan, yeah. um, transitions, like transitioning from you know um, dinner to getting ready for bed to bed, or transitioning b between classes. So these behavioral exposures, um, you know, are planned. We have the hierarchy. We know they are. We know what they are. They're structured and it's systematic. So it's not hodgepodge, um, you know, ec exercises that that don't really form kind of a direction of improvement. They're very systematic such that we start to you know, move from better tolerance of these easier triggers on up to the medium and the harder ones. That's the behavioral component of, of CBT. Then the treatment part is I then feel less anxious and I'm more tolerant of these situations. Does because that answer your question? Parent buy-in, right? Because if you've got a kid who's exactly. with the perfectionism and we're working on or you're working on helping them temper some of that, that also has to be okay within the family system. You're right, and sometimes it is, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's okay with one parent and not the other, which is exactly why we need the parents. You know, if, if, if we're talking mild, a case of mild anxiety, we don't need each, we don't need that, the parent, parental involvement becomes less important. We do need them because they're reinforcing the treatment goals at home. But in the case of more like rigid anxiety and more severe anxiety, that's exactly what we see that, uh, you know, in clinical practice. Um, and it makes sense. I mean, you know, if we have a child who's rigid and anxious, we might have a parent who's rigid and doesn't like the treatment goal, <laughs> right? right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so I'm going back to the more difficult to diagnose. Yep. But I'll say it's diagnosed, but yeah. talk about the assessment process. So let's say you have a, and, and the other thing is, like we talked all along here where I would assume most of your clients are people who their anxiety is impeding or hampering their ability to function. Mm -hmm. So how do you, if you know there's an anxiety issue, 
but there appears to be no impact on ability to function, except when the anxiety happens, mm -hmm. which is not every day. It's and so how do you how do you assess those situations and help? I mean, if you I, don't know the trigger, because you don't know what the trigger right. is, and the child doesn't know what the trigger is, or but they might, as you said, they they might, but it's not evident. It's not evident, mm -hmm. and which makes it more frustrating for the parent mm -hmm. because, and for the child because they never know when it's going to exhibit itself. Right. There are always vestiges. Like when anxiety is problematic, in times when it's not problematic, there are vestiges of they're, they're, the anxiety. They may not be seen as problematic, right? right. But, but they are um, present when the anxiety is problematic and need to be addressed. So in the assessment, can you get to them? Yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah, Good. I realize the time too, yeah, so yeah. No, 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 that's okay. <laughs> is that okay? Could be genetic factors, there could be you yeah. know, toxins, there could be diet, there, you know, like there's so many other variables. Or is that part of the assessment process as well? Um, it depends on the circumstance, uh -huh. right? Uh, so our normal assessment process is a clinical interview. Uh -huh. We have circumstances or, or children with more complex histories, and we have an assessment program that we implement in those circumstances. So, now, yeah. Uh, would we be allowed to keep your present your your link yeah. up for a little while? The video up. And I, I even I can put this in handout form and email it either in this form or handout form. You have it. Whatever you prefer. The handout form are just smaller, so you don't have so many pieces of paper. I mean, like, for example, the YouTube, because it's always nice to have your explanation with the slides as well. Is it possible for the district to leave the YouTube up for a little bit? I'm fine with that, yeah. Make sure you are yeah. okay with that. Yeah, oh, yeah, yes, yeah. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Irwin did bring some of her brochures here yeah, as thank well, you. and then I also have some additional.